This month, we go to Santander for the 2017 World Cup Series Finals. Plus, big changes for the Volvo Ocean Race, an exciting leap into the future with a nod to the past. But first, Bermuda, the venue for the 35th America's Cup. A spectacular setting for a show like no other. Flying cup boats, super yachts, the J-Class, and the Youth America's Cup pulled the crowds. And the World Sailing Show was there. boats, the best crews, and the most advanced technology. Yet little was known about how the 35th America's Cup would unfold. We didn't have to wait long to find out as the round robins got underway. Each team sailed each other twice, and there was drama from the start. Land Rover BAR came away with a penalty and a large hole in the boat. Elsewhere, the races got closer with every match. A contentious protest. Absolute joke. Gear failures and regular head-to-head -head battles. Keeping the boat airborne was key. Flight time was the new sailing metric. After two rounds, the lowest point scoring team had to leave. Group Armour Team France had taken two big scalps, but it was not enough. Their cup was over. Meanwhile, the defenders Oracle Team USA moved on and prepared for the cup match itself. Now there were four, as the battle to be the challenger continued. But Bermuda wasn't just about high-performance foiling cats. The Cup's grandparents were also in town. The J-Class. Only 10 were ever built from just 20 designs. And their reign lasted less than a decade. In the 1930s, they were the most technically advanced yachts in the world. For 87 years, they've been the epitome of the America's Cup. Today, little has changed. Although they're beautiful and they weigh 150 tons and have heated towel racks and air conditioning down below, from the deck up, we have the latest technology, carbon fiber rigs, carbon fiber rigging, carbon fiber sails, just like the highest tech materials, engineering and design as the uh, airfoils that are being used on board the catamarans. Seven Jays arrived in Bermuda, the largest gathering in the history of the class. Originals, replicas, and newly built yachts from original designs. This was a unique regatta. On the penultimate day of racing, Hanuman, Ranger, and Lionheart were poised in a three-way battle. A grand finale. A race that also promised to provide answers to an 80-year-old debate. In the 1937 America's Cup, Ranger had beaten Endeavour 2 soundly in the last ever J-Class battle. Hanuman is the modern interpretation of Endeavour 2. Lionheart was one of seven rejected Ranger designs from 1936. No one has ever known how she would have fared until now. The battle went all the way to the wire, with Lionheart taking the overall win, followed by Valsheda and Hanuman in second and third. History had been rewritten in an exceptional display of cup heritage. Technology and glamour were at the top of the agenda in Bermuda, but the island is also famous for a major contribution to the sport that lives on to this day. The America's Cup, always about technology, and Bermuda came up with a revolution in sailing technology when some sailors here invented the Bermuda rig. very fitting that the next step in technology, wing sails and foiling catamarans, is right here on the same waters. The Bermuda rig is the triangular sails you see today. Jay Kemp has spent 10 years recreating this historic vessel and educating Bermudan children about their maritime history. But he's also one of the founding members of the Bermudan Sloop Foundation. 
Back in the earlier days, there were, there were square riggers and tall ships with yard arms, and they, were, they, they sailed around the world mainly following the trade winds, so they, had, they wanted the wind behind them and had flat sails to push them downwind, whereas to sail upwind, they were very ineffective. The Bermuda rig was slowly developed by local Bermudians, mainly because of the prevailing winds. The capital of the island was in St. George's, which was dead downwind, and the, and the new capital and most of the island was upwind. These vessels were very fast, and indeed after the Battle of Trafalgar, the vessel that took the news back to the Admiralty in London was a Bermuda vessel called the Pickle. So she was Nelson's fastest messenger ship, and that's a really clear example of how valuable these ships were, not only to Bermudians, but to the British. Back in the cup, the battle to be challenger was building. Ben. Team New Zealand picked Land Rover BAR for the semi-finals, leaving Artemis Racing to take on SoftBank Team Japan. The task for Ainsley's team was tough, but there were further blows to come. A wing breakdown forced a retirement for the British from two races. Then the weather stepped in. Damage, retirements, and hair-raising moments, and a big shock as Emirates Team New Zealand capsized. All the crew were safe, but their boat was badly damaged. Battle scarred, but race hardened, and with their boat back afloat, Team New Zealand was still strong, slick, and fast. Beating the British 5-2, the Kiwis went through to the finals. The final result between Artemis and SoftBank of 5-3 said little of the battle that had raged. But in the end, the Swedish had taken control. On to the challenger final. New Zealand versus Sweden. Speed versus guile. Berling looked unhappy to engage in a head-to-head -head fight in the starts, while Outeridge was happy to push. Each time the Swedes gained the upper hand at the start, yet keeping it was more tricky. Penalties, breakdowns and accidents threw obstacles in their path. And Team New Zealand had speed to burn. The result? 5-2. Emirates Team New Zealand would be the challengers once again to face their arch-rivals of 2013. Creating a pathway for aspiring cup sailors has been one of the goals of the modern event. Running between the main America's Cup race days, 12 national teams, comprising six sailors aged 18 to 24, took part in the Red Bull Youth America's Cup. Going into the final day, Land Rover BAR Academy were leading overall. Switzerland's Team Tilt and Team France Jeune were just behind. But defending champions, NZL Sailing Team of New Zealand mounted an impressive last-minute comeback, taking two wins before the final race. To take overall victory, New Zealand needed to keep three places between them and the British. And as BAR Academy trailed the field in the final race, a Kiwi victory was on the cards. Yes, boys, that's all we can do. As they took their third win, the Kiwis believed they'd done enough. But in a bizarre twist, as SVB Team Germany hit the final mark, slowing others down in the process, the British sailed around the outside to finish second. Enough to retain the British victory. The time for talking had stopped. The 35th America's Cup was underway. High hopes in both camps, high stakes on the water. In the opening race, Spithill jumped the gun and paid the price with a penalty. The door had been opened. Team New Zealand came blasting through. I really like to be fast in this one. As winners of the qualifiers, Oracle had started with a one-point advantage, but that was now scrubbed. In race two, Oracle did their best to fight back, but the result looked the same. Emirates Team New Zealand was simply quicker. Then, a comeback by Oracle, before a poor jibe left them dead in the water, as Team New Zealand charged to the finish. There were hints of a change in race three. First to mark one, first to the boundary. Could Spithill now match the Kiwis' pace? Once again, the answer was no. 
right now, the Kiwis are hammering the Americans. Race four delivered more of the same. Team New Zealand had speed to burn. Four wins in their pocket and a scoreline that mirrored that of San Francisco in 2013. It's pretty obvious these guys are faster. These next five days will be the most important five days of the campaign. Two days, four races and no points. Oracle Team USA needed speed. Spithill said they'd found it. At the start of race five, the world watched and saw New Zealand dominate the race once again. And then came the change. Oracle fought hard for a win. Here we go. And the fighting talk followed. I was great to see a bit of fight out of these boys. It's oh. only just beginning, mate. <laughs> but the comeback was short-lived. And the Kiwis hurtling into match point. Team New Zealand was team perfection. Their new hero at the helm, 26-year-old Peter Bowen. Talented, unflappable, and after two further victories, the youngest ever helmsman to win the America's Cup. After 14 years, the Cup was going back to New Zealand. Coming up next, the fierce intensity of the medal racing from the 2017 World Cup Series Finals. And the Volvo Ocean Race announce a radical shake-up for the future. Still to come, the Volvo Ocean Race announced an exciting leap into the future. But first up, it's medal racing from the 2017 Santander World Cup Finals. After a full-on and challenging week of intense racing in Santander, the medal racing would determine who would be crowned 2017 World Cup Series champions. After a morning postponement, the medal races kicked off on the dune racing area in a light but fickle 8 to 12 knot northeasterly breeze that tested sailors and race committee alike. Fernando Echavari and Tara Pacheco of Spain really gave the home fans something to cheer about as they claimed a well-deserved mixed multi-hull NACRA 17 gold medal after a second place finish in the medal race. It was a real shootout in both the men's and women's skiff with the leading competitors narrowly split. Brits James Peters and Finn Sterrett entered the medal race one point ahead of Poland's Lukasz Przbytek and Pavel Kolodzinski, and fellow Brits Dylan Fletcher and Stu Bithel close behind in third. Peters and Sterrett sailed consistently, staying ahead of the Polish team before eventually coming through in second. We just sailed really, really consistently all week. We didn't actually win any races, but we, we just went out there and put ourselves in the mix. Przbytek and Kolodzinski finished in fifth, which was enough to seal silver. Brazil's Martina Grail and Kahena Kunz continued their dominance in the 49er FX, adding the World Cup Series title to their list of honours. But it was not all plain sailing. It's been uh, actually a really hard week and uh, lots of uh, mistakes, but we have came out just on top. The Brazilian duo had commented earlier in the week that they'd found the going tough. But like true champions, they really dug deep and pulled out a gold medal winning performance. They entered the medal race just three points ahead of Charlotte Dobson and Saskia Tidy of Britain. A fourth place for the Brazilians and a sixth for the Brits ensured it was Brazilian gold and British silver. Nico Parlier of France was head and shoulders above the foiling Formula kiteboarding fleet all week long and confirmed gold with ease. Feeling very happy. It's, it's a big honor for me to win that event. His victory ended Oliver Bridges' three-year run of World Cup Series victories but Bridge did enough to clinch silver. Defending World Cup Series champion Kieran Badlow of the Netherlands had given himself a solid 16-point advantage over Frenchman Louis Giard in the men's RSX windsurfer. It was a nice battle with the Swiss guy and he was, yeah, he was really charging and he was going really fast. So yeah, happy to get away with the third in the medal race and, uh, and the overall win. Giard followed in fourth to wrap up silver and race winner Shahar Zubari of Israel completed the podium. 
Brazil's Patricia Freitas was in cruise control in the women's RSX, having all but wrapped up gold. Freitas held a 20-point lead before the medal race, and only a disqualification could have seen her lose her grip. It was a pleasure just to cruise on the medal race. I, had, I could do that because of the points. China's Yongxiu Lu and Russia's Stefania Elfatina took silver and bronze, respectively. Zombo Beric of Hungary and Brit's Ben Cornish and Ed Wright were all in with a shot at gold in the Finn fleet. The distribution of medals was constantly changing, leg by leg. Cornish was penalised for pumping, but late drama ensued as Beric received a penalty of his own on the run to the finish. Cornish crossed the line in fifth, Beric seventh, which put the pair level on 48 points. But as the Briton had finished ahead in the medal race, Cornish claimed the gold. Wright finished tenth for bronze. Belgium's Evie van Acker had wrapped up gold in the women's one-person dinghy, laser radial, ahead of the final day of racing. The pressure was well and truly off Van Acker, so the story shifted to the race for the silver and bronze medals. Emma Plashart and Anne-Marie Rindom occupied the podium spots heading into the medal race, but Uruguay's Dolores Moreda and Greece's Vasileia Karachaliu were well within sight. Karachaliu, winner at the American World Cup Series event, came through in fourth to claim her silver, and Moreda delighted with bronze. The laser, men's one-person dinghy medal race, was the epitome of snakes and ladders. The lead changed regularly in the race and saw a tense fight for the medals. The leading racers received penalties, but Jean-Baptiste Bernard of France did just enough to seal goal. It was really hard on the, on the medal race, but finally I still save my place, so it's a good medal. Panagiotis Mantis and Pavlos Kagialis of Greece lived up to their billing as one of the pre-regatta favourites in the men's two-person dinghy 470. The Greek duo had plenty of pressure from Varga and Mayer of Austria, as well as Italy's Giacomo Ferrari and Giulio Calabro. Mantis and Kagialis sailed their way to a seventh place in the medal race to clinch gold. Great Britain's Rio Olympic champion, Hannah Mills, sailing with Ailey McIntyre, came back into the women's 470 with a bang, claiming a dominant gold. I think, you know, although we had a good points gap going into this medal race. They finished 19 points clear of the inform Aphrodite Zegers and Anneloos van Veen of the Netherlands, whose unbeaten run in 2017 ended. It was a good week for the Brits, as Great Britain won the nation's trophy, awarded to the best performing team at the World Cup final, after they won nine medals, three of each colour. The 2017-2018 World Cup series will commence this October at a new location in Gamagori, Japan. Forty-four years ago, one race started an offshore revolution. Amateur crews dressed in basic sailing gear headed off into the unknown armed with books, beer, and guitars. Eight months later, they returned from the inaugural Whitbread Round the World race as heroes and pioneers in their sport. Whitbread Trophy is presented by Prince Philip. Their adventure had taken them into the Southern Ocean, beyond reach, and into the unknown. A new style of racing had been born, but it had come at a price. Of 17 boats that started, five were forced to retire. Boats were dismasted and three crew members were lost. This was the toughest fully crewed race in the world. Today, it still is. Now called the Volvo Ocean Race, the event has seen many changes, but one key fact remains. A lap of the planet is grueling. Average speeds well into 20 knots are commonplace, while top speeds peak at over 30. The next event starts in October, but a radical shake-up is in store beyond that. We're announcing going to a, a two-boat format in the future. Three hulls in total, but a foil-assisted monohull for the ocean legs and a flying catamaran for the import series. We've ended up at a 60-foot length, which was a design process, uh, not to do with the fact that it happens to be the length of the Amoka 60. The boat itself is designed for the Volvo Ocean Race, some blistering pace. I mean, uh, we're in unknown territory in some ways. A lot of tinkerability, you know, the ability for the sailors to have lots of things to play with to learn, but still in a very strict one design. The debate around monohull or multi-hull for this race is one that's been running for some time. You could argue mono or multi, but both of those options would have one thing in common and they're foils. 
We don't think the foiling technology is quite there just yet for a foiling multi-hull around the world. But what we've been seeing with the Open 60s, they've successfully been foiling now for the last several years and we believe that it's just going to get better and better. They will be a little more tweaky, they will be a little more on the edge, but that's something else we maybe need to reintroduce into the race. We don't want this treat it like a rental car mentality, but we want to bring that seamanship back to ensure that the heart of sailing comes back into the Volvo Ocean Race. The new boat has been designed to sail with a smaller crew. At this stage we're looking between five to seven plus the onboard reporter. We still strongly want to encourage female participation and youth participation, not less sales. So maybe that idea of having the biggest guys on the boats is not there. So it could be attractive for female sailors and youth sailors. Because to make these boats go fast, you're going to have to steer them fast. And that's what a lot of the female sailing community can do. This new generation of foil assisted boats looks set to change how crews sail them. A lot of the job of the guys on board will be to tune the foils live and to keep close to flying and make the boat stable longitudinally, whether before it was just driving the boat and tuning the sails. We're going to go to faster apparent wind and closer angles. That will allow us to change the route as well. And yeah, it's all linked together. But the plans go beyond simply designing new boats. The course is going back to its roots. Whilst we have a strong and important commitment with Alicante for two starts, we will see starts and finishes from other parts of the world. A long Antarctica Southern Ocean leg point to point. Never happened in the sport before. A full around the world non-stop, why not? Around the world does mean some different things according to where you sit. Northern Hemisphere start in China, for example, or in Southeast Asia, down to the south, a full lap of the south and back up. Creating a new generation of modern, high performance boats while maintaining the original spirit of the race is an ambitious step forwards. Yet, whatever the outcome, it's unlikely that there will be beer and guitars on board. Next month, four monster trimarans and one ocean liner race across the Atlantic.